we need uh, a, uh, a rate uh, that uh, is below 3%. It's the lowest in history, the rate for a 30-year uh, fixed uh, uh, mortgage. Uh, and uh, obviously, accordingly, purchasing is going through the roof. I read somewhere that um, prices uh, have skyrocketed uh, and in some places they uh, went up by 25% uh, since the beginning of this year. And home or ownership actually grew during the, the crisis. Um, so we see that uh, the housing market is actually doing quite well. But, you know, I, I don't want to pour uh, rain on this uh, parade, but uh, where is all this going uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the possibility of a new uh, housing crisis? or a new bubble that can burst? Well, it's surprising because here in this area, our main problem is there are not enough houses to buy. And that's crazy. I, I, expected, I expected things to maybe burst or, or simmer down by now, or, you know, I thought, oh, what a terrible time to have to sell. And, and no, they can't, they can't keep inventory. So I think though that I would be very cautious about buying anything right now in a, in a very hot market. Some things are actually going for above their asking prices still, but I would be very cautious buying real estate right now and, and buy in an area that is not the most inflated. One of the you know, biggest winners of this uh, housing uh, boom uh, were Quicken Loans. Quicken Loans, uh, they monetized on the situation and they did uh, very well uh, during the crisis, especially with the uh, refinancing. And now we hear that uh, they are about to file for uh, an IPO. Um, some estimates uh, claim that they are going to be bigger than their uh, next door neighbors um, like uh, GM and Ford. Uh, they're from Detroit. Um, so what do you think, how, how will this IPO, again, if it will succeed, how will this uh, uh, affect the uh, non-bank mortgage market and what does it mean for the consumers? Yeah, so the IPO is really interesting and I'm, so I know they are, you know, they're, they're from Detroit. I'm a Cleveland guy originally and so I know we have a big quick and footprint there. Um, so, so I found this really interesting. So I, I think uh, actually 73% of Quicken's originations last year were from refinances. So the other 23% or 20, 27% were from purchases. So I think obviously the pandemic has caused rates to drop, increasing demand for refinancing further. And as you, as you kind of alluded to, Quicken has profited handsomely and, um, you know, put them on a stage to, to run their IPO. So I think non-banks looking, uh, might be looking at this as an opportunity to prioritize more digital lending. The process is a hundred percent contactless, hundred percent online. I know they, um, uh, have promised in, uh, at the end of 2019 that they are about to offer, uh, in all 50 States, the, the possibility of, uh, um, closing a, a mortgage hundred percent online. How does it work? can say that they've, they've figured out a way to do everything against the grain that traditional lending has done. So historically, um, when you're providing, uh, you know, income documentation, that's been a tedious process, right? But Quicken has a way of doing that a lot more efficiently through different technologies. Um, so all of that just happens really quickly. They use things like Plaid to connect your bank account so they can just check balances without having to validate with statements and all those types of things. So while I can't answer that directly, I would imagine that it, they've, they found a unique way to, to leverage technology to do that. Yeah, state laws and technology, it's not always uh, possible because you have the e-signing process, but it is uh, moving towards that uh, direction. We were uh, discussing forbearance uh, beforehand and um, um, again, it's very, um, um, it's kind of a no-brainer for a borrower to, uh, to go on that path, you know, why not just uh, uh, pay uh, my mortgage later, but uh, what are the implications for the long term? Uh, can it harm, let's say, my credit score or are there any uh, kind of uh, pitfalls that we're missing here? I think people should understand, you know, what comes next, you know, how, how does the repayment 
process work? Because I think the implication is, you know, once the forbearance ends or they get off forbearance, however that works, um, if they're stuck with a huge lump sum payment, they're just in as bad a shape or worse than they were before. And, you know, God forbid they might actually lose their home. So, I mean, I think that's, that's a, a key implication. Um, you know, the other side of it is, you know, will this, if we have mass unemployment and in, in some of the worst case scenarios come to pass and lenders have all these folks on forbearance, you know, how will this impact the mortgage market? Will this snowball and, you know, will, will lenders be, you know, will we have another financial crisis? Will it be hard to get mortgages, which could, you know, put an end to the housing boom? People that want to change something in their lives now in, in terms of the house that they live in, uh, what do you think, again, from a financial, for, from a pure financial point of view, uh, what do you think is best right now? To renovate your house, uh, you know, to uh, uh, kind of boost its value or uh, to move to another house uh, that is perhaps, um, uh, you know, in a different area or maybe uh, that is smaller and then you can uh, uh, decrease the, the amount of, uh, of uh, mortgage that you're paying on a monthly basis. It depends where you think the housing market's going. Um, so if you want to get a more expensive home, you're increasing your risk if the market goes down that you would lose more on your house. So if you have a $200,000 home now and you're buying a $300,000 home and both go down 20%, you're only going to lose 40,000 on the smaller home, but you'll lose 60,000 on the bigger home. But if you're downsizing, it works the exact opposite way. Say your kids moved out and you're really looking to move into a smaller home. If you move from a $300,000 home to a $200,000 home, you would only, or your risk would be much lower if the market went down across the board. Um, if you can renovate and be happy where you're at, if you're just sick of looking at your tired kitchen and renovating it will increase your value, you know, by all means, renovate your kitchen. I think that's a lower risk. You don't have to worry about qualifying for a mortgage again, but if you need to be in a different school district or you need to add two bedrooms because you just had twins, moving is pretty much the only thing that's going to get that done. So I think if you are still employed, now is an, uh, a time to kind of take that opportunity and, and talk to your employer about potentially working remotely and then maybe considering moving somewhere closer to family or moving somewhere for cost of living where you could still manage as in the past. For a lot of people who think that they're going to move someplace smaller, someplace cheaper, there, there has to be a large difference in the price of the new house to make that worthwhile. People underestimate how much it costs for closing costs, real estate taxes, and commissions, the whole works, the cost of moving, you're going to need different furniture. If you can't move to a house that's way cheaper, just stay put.